Well, thank you so much. Um, this is a new experience for me, so I'm really excited to be presenting. Uh, I titled this presentation From the Ritz to Roughing It, Adventure and Travel uh, with Type 1. So this is a Type 1 diabetes specific presentation. You'll see at the bottom it's brought to you by Connected in Motion. If you don't know what that is, oh, it's, sorry, uh, run by Type 1s for Type 1 adults. Um, I do not run it, but I'm a, a member of it. I attend their events, um, and this presentation uh, was created with myself along with uh, two other uh, friends of mine who run Connected in Motion. <clears throat> Here's a little bit more about it. It's basically type 1 diabetes adults who share vision, creating a culture of support and engagement in diabetes self-management. You can read the rest, but really it's the idea that we learn the most from each other from doing activities. So I've participated on hiking trips and weekend retreats and skiing trips, um, and through those experiences have learned all of these tips and tricks that I'm going to share with you tonight. <clears throat> But here's my disclaimer, and you'll probably hear me say this throughout the presentation. This, um, everything that I share with you tonight is based on my personal experiences. I am not a healthcare pr professional. I'm not a doctor. I teach grade one. So everything that I'm sharing from you is, is basically what I've experienced. Um, Please make sure that if you are interested in learning more or you're having questions that are really specific to your diabetes, that you're checking in with your own healthcare team and seeking out uh, your own medical advice. Okay? <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, there I am. That's me. Um, I live in Calgary. I've been pumping for 14 years. Uh, as Russell said, I, I teach in Calgary, so which means I have summers off, and I usually try and run away during those summers and travel. Um, the past summer, I spent in Ecuador and Peru, traveling and backpacking around. I spent uh, two months traveling and backpacking through Kenya, lots of backpacking and, and traveling through the United States from California to New York to North Carolina, all across Canada, um, except for the, the territories, but they're on my list. This upcoming summer, I've just decided I'm going to Iceland, so I really love traveling. And I, the type of travel I generally do involves that giant backpack you can see in the picture where I'm carrying everything with me uh, on my pack. Usually bent over and uh, crawling, but we make it, we make it through. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to try and touch on lots of different things. Um, again, I'm going to try and ignore the chat box so I don't get distracted, but please, 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 if you have questions, you can type them in if, so you don't forget, but I'm going to not answer them until the end to make sure that uh, I get through everything that I wanted to talk about. Okay, so I think the the biggest thing that we need to think about when we're traveling is packing our supplies. Uh, for me, this is a critical part of my travel plans, and it's generally, um, I start thinking about it a couple months in advance, and it's all about the numbers. So what I usually do is I do a couple of calculations. The first one is I want to look at my baseline. What is the minimum amount or number of supplies I'm going to need for the time that I'm traveling? So if I'm traveling for one month, my minimum number of pump sites I need, I kind of do a calculation in my head. I go, okay, I'm going to change my site every three days. I'm traveling for 30 days. I'm going to bring a minimum of 10 sites. I'm also going to apply that to my tubing, to my reservoirs, get my baseline. Then I'm going to assume that everything's going to go wrong <laughs> when I travel, and I'm going to start increasing the amount of supplies that I'm bringing. For me, I usually triple that supplies. So I double it to be safe, and then I triple it because I don't know if I'm going to lose my pack in a river. So when I traveled this summer to Peru, I uh, went for, what did I go for, six weeks. So I start off with my baseline. I'm changing minimum three times a day or three times a week, and I tripled that. I have a lot of supplies, but for me, that's just the, the safety that I feel. 
you just want to have lots of extras just in case. On top of that, I then start thinking about my pump. If you are a pumper, a good idea is to call into your pump company and see about getting a travel loaner pump. Um, if you're able to get one, you have your backup pump. Remember your backup batteries. I've run into this problem before. And again, assume you need more than you actually do. So I've got my triple supplies for me. I've got my backup pump. I've got my batteries. And then I keep thinking about my what-if scenarios. What if my pump falls into a river and starts floating away in rapids? Well, then I'm going to need some backup syringes. So I also want to bring a backup backup system, such as syringes and a long-acting insulin like Elantis or Levomir or whatever you're choosing to use with your healthcare team to bring along with that. If you look at my carry-on luggage, generally when I fly on a plane, it's pretty much all my diabetes supplies. I always want to make sure that's on the plane with me as carry-on. You also want to make sure you remember things like, is your glucagon up to date? I've run into that problem before. Um, and you also want to think about low treatment stuff. When I'm traveling, I don't, I'm already carrying enough weight with all my pump supplies, so I try and bring low treatment stuff that I can pack easily. Um, sometimes I bring the uh, glucose tabs, whatever brand that you like. I often get really tired of those, so I'll bring fruit-to-go bars. I've brought jujubes before. I've brought uh, Kool-Aid powder, just really easy access sugar that I have on me as well, just in case. Um, I'm also bringing lots of extra of my prescriptions. So just in case I need something, I have a copy of those on my person. I'm going to talk about um, temperatures, so I'll leave that until then. This sounds like a lot of supplies. You have to look at your own comfort level. For me, I just feel more comfortable when I have more supplies. I've also, uh, I'll talk about this later, um, I've also split up my supplies as well. And you can spread that out amongst people that you're traveling with, and I'll touch on that. I think uh, the main point I, you want to just say is lay it all out, make sure you have your little checklist, and, and you're good to go. <clears throat> all right, so when you're traveling, um, I've traveled both while wearing the pump and while on injunct injections. When you are wearing the pump, um, there are so many technical things that can go wrong that I think of. Um, I'm usually a very positive person, but when I'm traveling, I just I really try and think of all those worst case scenarios. So when I'm pumping, I'm thinking about my rates. I want to make sure I have those written down somewhere, my basal rates, my insulin to carb ratios, my uh, insulin sensitivities, just in case something happens and I lose that data on my pump, I can go back and get it. So I've stored that on my phone, I've stored that on a little piece of paper that I've stuffed into my pack somewhere. I also want to make sure that I have dosages in case I do end up having to go back to injections. So for me, what I've done in the past is um, I've chatted with my healthcare team and we've determined what my long-acting insulin rate would be or my dose would be before I'm traveling so that I'm not having to try and calculate this in the middle of a jungle in Ecuador when I don't have a calculator or the internet to help me. Um, and then it's an easier transition. If you are on multiple uh, injections, write down those rates too, and be prepared that they're going to change. Everything's going to change when you're traveling depending on what you're doing and where you're going and what you're experiencing. So just be prepared for lots of change. The uh, pictures that you see on the screen are all from different hiking trips. The top picture is with a five-day multi a uh, multi-hiking trip on the Juan de Fuca Trail on Vancouver Island. I was changing my basal rates almost every day because some days were really hard. A couple days we just lay on the beach. Um, so you, you need to be prepared for those changes. The bottom picture with me and my uh, pump was on a particularly awesome hike uh, up near Lake Louise where I didn't actually have to change anything because I had been hiking all summer and my body had just gotten used to it. So just staying on top of 
all of your testing, all of your adjustments, uh, I've found can make your trip go a lot smoother. All right, time zone changes. When I first started traveling uh, back in maybe the dark days of diabetes, it could be a real challenge of trying to time when my insulin was peaking and how I can change it. Uh, now with my pump, I find it a lot easier. So depending on what literature you read or who you're talking to, you, you'll hear different recommendations. I personally um, change my pump time when my plane lands. So when I traveled uh, to Kenya, we went through a couple of different time changes and a few different planes. Every time we landed in a new place, I was adjusting my time for that local time. That seemed to help for me. Now, I have some friends who will change their time when they cross the time zone lines in the middle of the air. And for them, that's just the way that they've planned to do it. If you are on multiple injections, I can't speak to that, unfortunately, because I'm not using that. If you are and you're listening in, start writing down what you do so we can share it at the end and we can get some really good tips from you. Uh, but generally, you're, I'm just testing a lot more when I'm on the plane. If it's a major time zone change, um, I just had some friends go down to Australia. One of them sitting with me in this room right now. Um, but I know my other friend who went down there, she was testing, testing, testing um, lots throughout the plane ride and making adjustments as she went to make sure that she was kind of tracking what was happening with her body. All right, dealing with food. This is where, um, I, this is a part that I can find really challenging. So one of the, um, one of the best parts about traveling is trying all of the interesting food out there. When I went to Peru, I had a list of all of the different types of food that I wanted to try, all the local specialties. It was very exciting, except when it came down to carb counting. This is where um, you kind of have to look at your own personal expectations for food. The first thing that I do is I always make sure that I have my own personal stash of food. So I have, I have my low treatment stuff. I usually bring with me a whole bunch of granola bars as well, or power bars, or lara bars, or luna bars, whatever you want, so that if I really can't find something to eat or if something's not working for me, I always have food. I think as um, people living with type 1 diabetes, we're acutely aware of food, when we need to eat next or when was the last time we ate. I think about food all the time, so knowing I have extra food usually makes me feel a lot better. I generally will also hide food somewhere in my luggage. So I have a secret stash of a granola bar or a fruit to go bar somewhere hidden that I can access if I need to. Uh, I hiked the West Coast Trail a few years ago with some friends. Um, I hid food in my pack that nobody knew about. And uh, <laughs> we almost, almost didn't have enough. We, we, were, we were fine, but it was cutting it close. But I knew I had my secret stash of food, and that made me feel a lot more relaxed about the whole thing. Especially when people were hungry, you've put in a really long day, you don't know what's going to happen with blood sugars over the night. So that's one thing that I do to make sure I feel good. Now the other side of it is when you get this really exotic looking plate of whatever, how do you figure out how many carbs? Or if I'm in, uh, you know, the Savannah in Kenya, my, you know, Calorie King app is not going to work on my phone to figure out how much food is in this rice dish. For me, what I do is, uh, the first thing is I evaluate my expectations for the trip. I might have to decide that for me, I'm going to just not be as tight as I am when I'm in the city, when I'm in Calgary, or I, I'm just going to, you know, relax for a little bit and try it out. One tip that I learned from a friend was if she gets a bowl of something and she has no idea, she'll give herself a bolus for a minimum amount. So she might look at this bowl of rice stew and say, 
there is probably at least 40 grams of carbohydrate in here. I'm going to dose for that, and then I'm going to start testing a lot to see what's going to happen to my blood sugar. I've used this method before, and again, this is just my personal experience, um, and it, it can be a safe way to try different foods. So I'll bolus for, you know, in, in this stuffed pepper from a street market in, you know, this random town in Peru, there's probably 40 grams of carbohydrate. I'm going to bolus for that, and then I'm going to start testing a lot. So every half an hour to see what's happening. Um, it might be that I start my blood sugar starts rising really quickly, and then I can correct that. Or it might be that you know my blood sugar starts dropping, and I can also uh, start dealing with that and treating with it. One thing that I found when I was in Kenya is that meals were really spaced far apart, so we would eat breakfast really early in the morning. There wouldn't really be a lunch, and dinner would be very late at night, um, and it would be a really, really heavy meal. This goes back to those, in, those insulin rates that I spoke to earlier of being prepared to change your rates or being prepared to set those temporary basal rates and just testing a lot. Um, in terms of food allergies, I don't, I don't have any, but I have traveled with friends who do um, have gluten sensitivities or are concerned about other products in the food. And what I've observed from them is you just really have to become a really strong advocate. Um, I have had experiences where I can feel my blood sugar dropping. It's 8 o'clock at night in a mud hut. And I, I need to speak up to say I need, uh, I need something to eat. But for me, it's a lot of the fun of traveling is trying all that, that weird food. So um, I, I try and just look at what I've got, do my best job, and then just test really frequently. I have a story about food that I'm going to share later on. Um, but it is a good idea, aside from the diabetes, is to look at where you're purchasing your food um, and also making sure that it, it's going to be safe uh, for you to eat. There's like a little preview of, of my story. <laughs> um, and again, at the end of this uh, talk, I, I really hope that people will share more stories of what they've experienced or if they have any tips. Um, but my takeaway message would be have that emergency stash or that secret stash that nobody knows about and also um, be prepared that, you know, maybe your control isn't going to be perfect during, during the traveling, uh, but you can certainly do it in a safe way. <clears throat> uh, the pictures that you see are all from hiking and camping trips. Uh, that's a lot of the traveling that I do, but it's certainly not all of it. Okay, your diabetes plan. What to do if things go wrong? They will. Uh, the pictures that you see here, we've got a site that pulled out that was saved by duct tape. Um, we've got a meter on the bottom that was reading just crazy numbers. This meter in particular was telling me my blood sugar was 1.7, but I felt completely fine. Another meter told me I was 7.8, and a third meter told me I was, you know, 11. I had no idea what my blood sugar was other than that I wasn't low. Um, and the top picture just shows a CGM graph that's really looks like a mountain range, so it's up and down. I think the first thing that you want to make sure you have if you're deep plant when things go wrong is those backup supplies. I can't, going over that packing list to make sure you have everything you need, extra sites, extra tubing, extra reservoirs, really can save you a lot of stress. Having people that also know what your diabetes plan is is very helpful. So in the case of the pump site that ripped out, um, she had forgotten to bring an extra pump site. It was lucky that we had that duct tape to fix it, but if someone else had been carrying a pump site, that would have saved the duct tape experience. So if you share what your diabetes plan is, that can be helpful because other people can help you. I think um, sometimes we forget that even when we're traveling somewhere, we bring our huge carry-on luggage filled to the brim with diabetes supplies. Then we park it at the hotel and we go off for a walk for three hours. I've done this before where I've just forgotten to take that extra site with me or that extra 
an insulin vial. So recognizing that once, even once you arrive at your destination, you're still doing traveling is important as well. Um, finally, letting people know where you are. Later in the presentation, I'm going to touch on traveling in a group or traveling by yourself, um, which I've done both of. And one thing that I do, regardless of what size group I'm in, is I send my travel plan to someone. So even though I'm a, an accomplished teacher and an independent living in Calgary, I still let my mom and my dad know where I am in the world. I will send them my itinerary so that they know where I am, and I'll give them approximate times when I'm going to check in to say everything's okay. So uh, when I was in Peru, they knew when I was in a major city, I said, I'm going to email you in, you know, three days. If you do say that, please make sure you follow up with them because <laughs> uh, you don't want them calling, you know, the Peruvian National Guard on you. Um, but having those people kind of know roughly where I am has been, been helpful in a number of different situations. And also, if you don't have access to internet or phone, telling them that you don't have access is also really important. I th yeah, I think, I think I'm going to touch on more things as we go along, but really, it's just having those plan A's, those plan B's, those plan C's, those plan D's ready to go, and sharing what you're doing is really important. Duct tape doesn't help either. Everyone should get some. Okay, um, so when we developed this presentation, um, the girls and I really, we had a whole variety of different traveling experiences, and one thing that we talked about is how type 1 is viewed around the world. We're really, really lucky that we live in Canada or in North America with, with diabetes, although, I mean, I sometimes feel like nobody understands what I'm living with or what I'm going through. The type 1 awareness in Canada is amazing. When you go traveling in other places, it's viewed very differently. When I traveled through Kenya, um, it was often viewed as something very wrong with me, that, oh, you, I'm so sorry that you have this. And that was a really a big shocker for me, that they viewed it like that. Um, there's also the idea that the importance of my diabetes can be very small compared to the other problems or the other experiences people are having in their own community. One of the girls who made this, this picture is from her traveling in Saudi Arabia and for her even pulling out her pump to bolus was a totally different experience in, in Saudi Arabia than it is in Canada and she had to be really aware of being respectful for when she was taking her pump out uh, to give herself a bolus. And that was a, a different awareness for her. When I was in Peru, one thing that was really helpful to me was learning how to say I have diabetes in different languages. And I've uh, done that in Swahili. I've done that in Spanish. I can barely say it in French, but it's, in a, it's really important. Um, I've had some experiences with airport security, which is coming up very soon. Um, in Cuba, where they didn't speak English, they were wondering what I had on me, um, and I was able to whip out my Spanish, you know, phrase book to help explain that I had diabetes and then everything was okay. So we can get really consumed with our own, um, our own country, our own perception of what people should know, but being open to the fact that you might have to explain it and you might be looked at in a different way, I think is a, an important thing to consider. Okay, so this is what I was talking to you um, previously, which is, who are you with? Are you going to travel alone, or are you going to travel with a group? So I've done both. Um, last summer, I had the opportunity to go to San Francisco, which was lots of fun, but I went on my own for a week. and. Traveling alone is a little different. Um, it's great, but you really do have to be on the ball because you are your support system. So in San Francisco, what I noticed I started doing is I was really testing my blood sugar a lot, a lot, a lot because 
I was trying new foods, I was going on different activities, I was walking, I was doing cycling, I was doing lots of different activities, and I wanted to make sure that I was going to be safe. I find that when I'm traveling alone, I um, am checking in more frequently with people at home. So whereas if I'm with a group, I might send in a rough overview of my itinerary. When I'm traveling alone, I'm sending more frequent updates, and I'm also sending a little more detailed information. I also really make sure I've got my medic alert on. This is my own personal struggle that I have is keeping my medic alert on and visible. But when I'm traveling alone, it is on my wrist. I recently did a, um, a backcountry ski course, which is in the mountains. And the first thing I wanted to tell that guide was, I have type 1, here's my medic alert, here's where all my emergency stuff is, because I was alone, I wasn't with people who knew me, and I wanted to make sure I was safe. So traveling alone has taught me that I have to be a really strong advocate for myself, and I have to be really open to talking about my pump and sharing that with others and checking in. Similarly, or kind of similarly, but when I'm traveling with a group, um, I'm really lucky in that I have a huge community of type 1 friends. So I've traveled in groups of all type 1, and I've also traveled in groups where I'm the only type 1. Um, the picture on your right-hand side is a connected in motion hiking trip. So everybody had type 1. It is an awesome experience because everyone is going through the same thing. Everyone has extra supplies, um, and it's a very comfortable way to travel. When you're the only one with type 1, you still have to be a really strong advocate for yourself. Um, you still need to make sure your group knows what to do if something goes wrong. You still need to make sure your group knows where all of your emergency supplies are. You still need to be checking in um, with people at home to make sure if that's what you choose to do. So both are great. Um, I think it's just if you're alone, making sure you've done those extra preparations plus some when you're in a group, depending on who you're traveling with, making sure that they know where your supplies are. I've uh, done this in the past where if I'm with a group, I'll often create little plastic baggies of mini supplies. So if my luggage is lost, which it has been many times, <laughs> I'm not in a panic of, you know, missing my supplies because I've given a little supply kit to a friend with maybe, you know, two or three sites that they can carry or a backup vial of insulin and some syringes that will definitely cover me for a couple of days. I will also uh, spread out where my supplies are. So once my carry-on luggage has come off and I'm in my hotel room or at my campsite with my group, we'll kind of divvy it up and, and spread it out so that it's logically organized so that if a piece of luggage is stolen or lost, um, I, I'm not going to have a complete freak out uh, by realizing that my all my diabetes stuff is gone. Um, that supply bag it is actually coming to play a number of times where something has happened. My I dropped a bat pack in a river or my luggage didn't make it to Hawaii and uh, but luckily I had that little supply bag there. so that was that was great. Okay, insurance issues. Do I need it? Yes, you do. <laughs> uh, this past summer in Peru, I uh, got very, very sick. It was not related to my diabetes at all. It was related to my food choices at a street market, um, and a walking clinic visit turned into a three-day uh, hospital adventure, and having that travel insurance was so incredibly important for my stress and for my sanity. So please, this is my own personal <laughs> recommendation, please make sure you have insurance. Um, if you do need it, it's a really easy process to access. You should get some sort of card or contact information, and from wherever you are, you should be able to call them and then they'll walk you through the process. In terms of where to get insurance, I can't speak to that. I have uh, insurance through my employer. There are lots of places that offer it. Um, I know when I was in university, I shopped around a lot to find a good insurance company that would provide me with good diabetes coverage. So I would just recommend doing your research. Um, 
Both of these pictures are not of me, but they're of other friends that helped create this presentation. Um, the picture on the left is from a mud run, where you are running through a pile of mud. Pump wrapped in a plastic bag can seem like a good idea at first, Maybe not uh, having that insurance is, is a good <laughs> reason, uh, is a good, a good thing to think about. The second picture is of my friend Julie um, who went scuba diving. She had some crazy things happen and, and luckily her insurance was able to help her out a lot. So do your research, make sure that you're covered, make sure you have backup plans. But I can't speak specifically to who you should go with or anything like that. Okay, so one thing that I've noticed when I'm traveling with a group is even though there's safety in numbers, if I do not share a lot about my diabetes, it actually creates more stress for the people that I'm traveling with. So this picture was taken on the last day of the West Coast Trail, which is um, we did it a seven-day backpacking trip, again on Vancouver Island. And what happened on the first day is that I said I was fine. No problems, I got this covered, and I didn't share a lot about my diabetes. What I noticed is that the girls I was traveling with, they seemed anxious. Are you okay? How are you feeling? Should we stop? It was almost like by not sharing that information with them, I was creating more stress. What I do now is I try and give lots more information. So if we're hiking and I can feel my blood sugar dropping, I'll tell my group, okay, I'm okay right now, but I can feel that I'm dropping. We might need to stop. And for me, I've, I've noticed that for others around me, it just reduces that worry. And then they're able to, to recognize that we might need a break or they might be able to help me get out some snacks. Um, similarly, if I am fine, I don't just say fine, I might show them my meter to prove it because they're obviously if you're traveling with them, they're either a friend or a colleague or somebody that cares about you and uh, you can support them as well. It's not just us that needs the support. Oh, adventure sport, this one is fun. So. I love traveling for food, but I also love it for trying lots of different things. When I was in Ecuador this summer, I went whitewater rafting, I went zip lining, we were cycling down volcanoes, and I'd never tried any of those sports. So adjusting my insulin was really, really important. I had no idea what whitewater rafting was going to do to my blood sugar. So what I had to tell myself at the beginning of the day was, just try something and go with it. Uh, I tried a temporary basal rate to start. My adrenaline was pumping so much that I needed a correction during the day. Uh, really helped to minimize, uh, minimize the stress. And I also gave myself permission just to try everything new. When I first got diabetes, I didn't think there was a lot of sports that I could do because of my blood sugars or I didn't want to go low. Uh, now there's no sport that I won't try. It's just making sure you have a plan. You've got an extra fruit bar, and you're just testing your blood sugar lots and lots and lots. Um, as a side note, I will wear a spy belt um, or a little fanny pack or something on me usually all the time, and that I keep in it um, an extra syringe, maybe some extra insulin, an extra fruit bar, so I always have something on me. Um, just in case I lose a meter in the, in the white water rapids or, or something like that. Um, this one I'm interested to hear about people's stories at the end of this discussion. My take on this one is that this will be a short and sweet um, slide. My take is that I am just going to be prepared that I'm going to be stopped at security, and that's okay. Um, there is a huge knowledge base about the insulin pump today as opposed to 16 year, or 15 years ago when I started on the pump. Um, and I've just found that if I am polite to them and just present everything, um, that I get a better response. So that's all I would like to say. If you do have any crazy stories, and oh, I've, got, I've got lots of them, in, one of them involving, you know, sitting in a glass box in Atlanta for an hour <laughs> with a very uh, strong security guard presence. But uh, 
I just take it that they're doing their job, and I can just help them by doing my job. But if you do have a really good story, please share it at the end. Um, I will mention there is uh, there are the new scanners in the airports, and if you are wearing a pump, um, what I would suggest is just making sure you're checking with the pump company before you're going through those to make sure that uh, you're doing the right thing or you're making the right decision. Okay, and finally, um, please don't forget it's not all about the diabetes. So all of my travel adventures, medical adventures, have generally not been about my diabetes. I find that I can get so consumed with packing my supplies or making sure I have enough insulin or making sure I have enough sites that I might forget that I need toothpaste or I might forget I need my passport to travel. Um, I've had a couple of crazy things happen um, in Peru. I got sick, not related to my diabetes at all, so it came out of nowhere. When I traveled to Kenya, I was so concerned about my diabetes supplies. I packed them all in a backpack. I got on the airplane. I wear glasses, so I took off my glasses to have a nap. I'm shifting around in my seat, and I break my glasses in half. I didn't bring a spare pair of glasses because I was so worried about my diabetes. So I walked around Kenya with duct tape around my glasses for six weeks, um, which was interesting. Um, so there are lots of other things to think about other than your diabetes. And similarly, you're traveling to experience a new culture, a new land, a new food. Um, and you, I need to give myself permission that I can also experience those things and not just be focused about my diabetes. So uh, those are kind of the lessons I've learned. Um, uh, another story is when I was in Africa, I got some just crazy, crazy bug bites, and uh, they all got infected, and I was so worried about my diabetes. And then I went to a hospital, and you know the doctor looked at me and just, told me, kind of the look said, you are crazy. All you have are these little bug bites, and we've got all these really sick people here. And that was a good reminder to me that it's not all about my diabetes. There's lots of other stuff going on. Um, before I open up for questions, I do realize I mentioned I was going to talk about temperature. Um, I'll just throw that in. Um, I use a Frio pack for my insulin. That's a pack, basically, it has a gel insert that if you run under cold water, the gel will almost inflate or expand and keep your insulin cool. Similarly, if I'm in somewhere really cold, I'm just keeping my insulin really close to my body, either by wearing a fanny pack or a spy belt or um, tucking it into an undershirt uh, and making sure it stays warm that way. So at this point, that's kind of everything I have to say, 